2022 has started off with a bit of an equity market wobble, so I thought this would be a good opportunity to discuss what's called the great rotation. Some sectors have actually sold off sharply, others have rallied, so what are the drivers behind that and how should we play it as investors? So in this video we're going to look at the great rotation in a bit more detail. Just as you can have the surface of the water of the ocean looking like it's kind of calm, but you can see that there's something going on underneath. Similarly, when you get a rotation in markets, there's the broad indices like the S&P 500, which aren't necessarily selling off much, but at the same time, some of the stocks in the index can be moving a lot. And in this case, we've had some really big sell-offs in some parts of the market. So that's what we mean by rotation. Some of the stocks, some of the groups of stocks under the surface are moving, but the broad level of the index isn't selling off much. So we have had a bit of a wobble at the beginning of the year, but it hasn't been too big. So if we look at the actual epicenter of the sell-off at the moment, there's this Goldman non-profitable tech index, which you can see here in pink. And you can see since January the 4th, that's sold off very sharply. Whereas if you look at the S&P broadly, it hasn't really sold off much at all. So this is a really nice example of a group of stocks which have sold off a lot. And when some of those are selling off, obviously there are other groups of stocks, in this case, the reopening index, which are stocks which benefit from people going about their normal activities, things like airlines, restaurants, where we're going back to kind of normal behavior those are the ones which are actually rising at the moment. You can see that the two are pulling in opposite directions. And although there has been a bit of a sell off, it's been much less dramatic than it is for these particular sectors. And then if we look at something like Kathy Wood's fund as an example of non profitable tech, maybe it's not that non profitable. So tickers you can see on the right hand side of this graph are the ones which are profitable because the x-axis is the latest quarterly profit in millions of dollars. So Tesla, very profitable. Coinbase, also very profitable. Everything to the right of the dash red line is profitable. But the majority of the stocks which Kathy Woods owns in Arc K are not profitable. So these would be non-profitable tech companies. For example, Robin Hood or DraftKings, for example, or Teladoc. Now, why have those sold off? Well, and how much have they sold off? So if I just look at those three, so this is actually Twilio, DraftKings and Teladoc relative to where they were pretty much at the peak of these growth cap stocks, which was in February uh, 2021 you can see that there's been a very dramatic sell-off in those unprofitable companies. And I'm going to have two reasons for that. Now, if we also look at factor funds, so in this case, I've got two factors which I'll look at for US stocks. This is large cap growth. And here you should be thinking of mega cap companies like Google, Apple, uh, Microsoft. Those are the ones which have really held up over the last 10 years and driven the S&P higher. And in fact, global markets higher. They've just performed so well. Whereas if we look at small cap growth, so these would be tiny companies, which also growth companies, many of which are bought by Kathy Wood. You can see that these really have turned the corner at that February the 10th date. That was the point at which the rally ended for Kathy and also for many of these small cap growth stocks. And if we look at how much that style of investing has sold off and we break it down by style you can see large cap growth is up 20 percent but at the same time small cap growth is down about the same amount minus 17 percent and if you actually look at the top you can see high dividend yield is another factor that's done particularly well a style of investing which has done very well you're probably thinking well why is this happening you know what's the causes behind it I think the first one is rising interest rates, because that's what a lot of the narrative is at the moment, certainly. So if you look at the Federal Reserve, you know, they're saying they're going to raise interest rates three times in 2022. Some people say they'll have to raise it more than that. And we have seen yields start to increase quite sharply during the course of 2022 at the very beginning of 2022. And this shows you the 10 year yield in red versus the pure value portfolio return. And the two tend to track each other fairly well over the course of this one year period in 2021. 
It's not a perfect correlation, but it's reasonably closely linked. So it seems as if value, which is the opposite of growth, seems to be performing well in this new environment of higher interest rates. So that could be an interesting trend if you expect rates are going to carry on increasing during the course of 2022 and beyond. However, if you look back over a longer period of time, the relationship isn't as strong, I don't think. I mean, you can see that yields, so that's the bottom graph in red, yields have been gradually falling since 2004. So when this blue line moves down, it's when the Vanguard value fund underperforms the growth fund. So value is VTV, growth is VUG. These are the American version of those factor funds. And this has been gradually moving down since yields have been moving down. But it is consistent with that narrative that value outperforms when yields are increasing. So when yields are falling, as they are over this period since 2004, value underperformed. So that is consistent with the story, although the correlations I don't think look very convincing. If we do it year by year, going back much further in time, and in order to do this, I had to use the farmer French factors. So this is showing you the periods when value outperforms in red, when we're above the dashed red line, and value is underperforming when we're below the dashed red line. And what we're showing on the x-axis is the level of yields at the beginning of the year. So for example, in 2021, yields were very, very low at the beginning of the year. That's the lowest they've been over this entire period since the early 70s. Whereas in 1982, you can see yields started off the year at around 15%, not much less than 15%. Now, there is a broad relationship here. It's very crude. When we start the year at very low interest rates with a 10-year, you can see that that's been mostly recently since the financial crisis when rates have been so low since 2008, in fact, generally in those periods, values underperformed. So that is consistent with low yields being unfriendly to value and friendly to growth. But it's not a very strong relationship and it's not a very predictive relationship. But all you can really broadly say, I think, is that value tends to do better when yields are higher. You know, I think, I think if that's what your belief is, then maybe the way to play this is to move from growth to value. But personally, I'm not convinced that firstly, yields will be particularly high as we go into 2022, because growth, I think, will probably disappoint. And yield is linked to growth. Uh, and also, this relationship shows you that even when yields are high, there are many years in which value underperforms. The second reason I think that we're seeing this rotation is due to a fading euphoria. Now, nobody would have predicted that after a pandemic and during a pandemic that have been such a huge surge into risky assets, cryptocurrency, the riskiest corner of equity, and yet that's exactly what happened. Before we go into that, let me just quickly explain what the Russell 3000 is, because we'll have to see a graph about that in a sec. If you're not familiar with the Russell 3000, the idea is that the Russell 3000 represents about 98% of US stocks, and it's split into two components, a large cap component, which is the Russell 1000. Those are the thousand largest US companies. And then there's the Russell 2000, which are the small caps. So if we talk about the Russell 2000, think small cap US stocks. And we're going to look at the price to earnings ratio. So this is a valuation for small caps. Small cap growth is in blue and small cap value is in green. Unfortunately, these are colors I can't see because I'm colorblind. So I hope I chose the right ones. And then the overall Russell 2000 is shown in red. Now, what's really clear here is that growth usually comes with a premium. People are willing to pay more for every dollar of profit for a growth stock than they are for a value stock. That's always been true. But what, look at what happened since 2009. Gradually, the premium that people were willing to pay for growth increased until it kind of peaked. In fact, it went off the graph. They had to kind of cap the graph for the valuation of small cap growth in the US. So I'd call that a kind of irrational exuberance. People were just willing to pay far too much of a premium for growth. And generally, with these price to earnings ratio, they mean revert. That means that they don't carry on increasing forever. They come back to their long term average. You don't know when, but they do. And that's exactly what we've been seeing recently. Far from being off the scale as it was uh, during much of 2020, this is very rapidly mean reverting. What you can also see here is that for small cap growth, valuations are still a long way 
from their long-term average. So the long-term average would be more like, I don't know, 25. Currently, they're still at around, certainly over 40, around 45 times the forecast earnings. So it's not the case that small cap growth is cheap yet. It's not. It's got further to fall. And if we see rates carry on increasing, I suspect that that trend will continue. So when people say that the entire market is expensive, that's not true. It's small cap growth, which is firstly sold off most, and it's also been the most overpriced type of equity during this pandemania period. If we look at the forward price to earnings values for growth and value, now we're not just looking at small cap now, we're looking at the entire S&P. The story is very similar. So gradually since 2009, the premium for growth has increased, and now it's at a very wide margin to value. So that growth premium is still expensive, and it's still well above the averages historically. So at some point, that will correct. It always has historically. And if we look back to 2000, during the dot-com bubble, there was a similar outperformance of growth as this exuberance fed into growth tech stocks, in this case, internet companies. So there are certain analogies with that period. But remember that what's give, been the backbone of the S&P has been large cap growth. And those companies are very profitable and they aren't all very expensive. Some of them are, but for example, Amazon isn't particularly expensive. I'm not that negative about the broad index as a whole. It's just small cap growth that I'm concerned about because of that mean reversion. I think this euphoria, a good measure of euphoria, is looking at how many people are buying derivatives on the equity markets. So for example, this is a this is a graph which has been shared from Bloomberg by Lizanne Saunders. And what this shows you, let me just zoom in on that graph, is the total option call volume. So these are options to buy equity. So they're kind of bullish equity options. And that's shown in blue. And you can see these waves of retail investors entering the market and then subsiding. So there are three waves of this increase in call option volume as optimism and exuberance surges and then fades away again. And you can also see, if you look at the non-profitable tech index from Goldman Sachs, that does seem to correlate with the increases in that index. So it looks like that kind of support for the market has gone away. And I think that shows that probably this euphoria that we saw previously from last year as interest rates increase and as valuations normalize, those people are stepping back from the market. And this mentality of buy the dip, whatever happens, has kind of gone away. In summary, then, I still remain quite positive about equity markets in 2022 because the backdrop's still quite positive. We've still got fairly good earnings growth. Credit funding costs are still pretty low with tight credit spreads. And even though the Fed's going to be raising interest rates, by historical standards, remember, those rates are still very low. And that's good for equity. And at the same time, we're seeing the pandemic start to ebb. So there are lots of reasons to be positive about equity generally. But I wouldn't be taking too much exposure to small cap growth because evaluations are still high, even though they're still falling quite sharply. I don't think that's going to turn around anytime soon. But remember also that we have our Patreon offer. So if you want to support us and you want to learn more about investing, it's a great way to do that with other people who are like minded. If you want to learn more about that, just click on the link beside me and in the description below me. And as always, thank you for listening.